Inside the pack, I had carefully placed the gold bracelet, a thick Victorian piece decorated with flowers, whose petals were made of sapphires and whose centers of diamonds. A few of the diamonds were missing. I was to pick up the replacements at a jewelry exchange down the street and carry everything to the setter, who would fit the gems into the bracelet. I was 22 and this was my summer job. My father paid me what I had made teaching English as a second language at college, an amount that two months earlier he had dismissed as underpayment. If they went anywhere else, they would be paying at least twice as much, he'd complained. Now, with the pack secured, I stood next to his safe, a massive silver-gray box that hovered like a crouching giant at 42 inches high. In addition to two doors and a combination code, there was a key formed from a long rod with an encoded tip that had to be reassembled with each use. Inside the safe lay dozens of black boxes with windowed tops through which the diamonds sparkled. There were black trays filmed, filled with gleaming old jewels, a musky cameo brooch, a diamond pin with a hunk of aquamarine, a velvet necklace with a green peridot gem paired into the shape of Medusa's head, and a flower diamond brooch that shivered when shaken. Once I even spotted a gold chain with dangling, angry-looking warriors' faces painted onto blocks of ivory. Most of my father's jewelry is old. It suggests a time in which not only taste, but also bodies were different. He owns wristwatches so slender, they look as if they'd break if, if one ever checked the time, and earrings so heavy, I could imagine them tugging on the lobes of giants. On top of the safe is a framed picture of his brother, Steve, sitting tranquilly on a boat in the middle of a lake. Near the desk where my mother works when she comes in to assist my father, stand six photographs depicting my parents on a night out in Germany, where they grew up and lived before I was born, and a shot of our family at my sister's bat mitzvah, my mother draped in diamonds. Behind my father's table is an old photo in which his business friend Lester sits on his lap, while my father wears an exaggerated expression of pain. Though my father's appearance is orderly, he believes in tidiness in general and clean fingernails in particular, his desk is often cluttered with papers, stones in boxes, and trays, of and trays of jewelry. He sits the farthest possible distance from the door so that he can keep watch over who enters his office without being within their immediate reach. Next to him is a row of windows through which the masses of foot traffic that flood New York's Diamond District are visible, or would be if he didn't always keep his shades drawn. Cameras displaying the hallway outside hang from the wall, and beneath his desk, always at his fingertips, is a red panic button that summons the police. The office itself is like a safe. To leave that day, I passed through three doors. First, a standard gray lightweight, then a bulky metallic one containing a bulletproof window with a bank slide for quick and secure exchanges, and finally the outermost door, wooden and professional looking, bearing the company name Oltuski Brothers, though there is only one brother in the business. The wooden door and the metallic one are set up so that when one is open, the other locks automatically to slow getaways in the event of a robbery. Having two or three doors isn't unusual in the Diamond District, but this labyrinth of security particularly suits my father. This is a man who made his entire family wear surgical masks for weeks after my sister's birth. He wouldn't let me near the playground sprinklers because he'd heard somewhere that they could spread hepatitis. He forbade me from marching in the Israeli Day Parade with my classmates and all the other Jewish school students in the tri-state area. Too many Jews in one place, he said. A perfect target for terrorism. A perfect target was why I couldn't go on my high school's graduation trip to Israel. The fortification of the diamond business seeped into our private lives, and my father hid us from the world just as fiercely as he hid his stones. Because he wanted to keep me safe, he didn't dress me in his diamonds. In fact, I wasn't allowed to pierce my ears until I was 16, because he'd heard somewhere that muggers had torn a woman's earring straight out of her lobes on the streets of New York. Any gem I possessed was kept in my father's safe, along with my baby teeth. I never minded any of this until once in synagogue, his friend looked at my arm and said to him, what, not even a little bracelet? And I burned with shame. As I left the office, I passed by the framed decorative cards my mother had hung in the corridor to make the white fluorescent lit room less sterile. A cat wearing a diamond tiara, loose diamonds glimmering inside an egg carton, a cartoon diamond that says, you rock, and a Samuel Johnson quote, our brightest blazes are commonly kindled by unexpected sparks. She believes that if the office looks nice, people will be inspired to buy. 
In the lobby of our building, I pushed past the turnstiles by the security desk, through two more doors, and then I was on the street with $5,000 worth of jewels strapped to my body. I was nervous. Four years as an English major hadn't prepared me for diamond deliveries, and neither had my father. He applied silence to as many parts of our life as he could, especially diamonds. He was always hiding things. If a stranger asked what he did for a living, he never said he was a jeweler. Instead, he made up a different profession. Sometimes he sold insurance. Other times he was a product representative. But I didn't have an alternate persona to slip into. Instead, I crossed Fifth Avenue from the quieter east side where my father's office building resides to the west and tried to act casual. But when you are carrying diamonds, each block is a continent. I was greeted by two colossal diamond-shaped lamps built atop giant metallic stanchions. These columns guard all four corners of 47th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues and signal the borders of the district's most important quarter. Crossing was like going from an American suburb to a medieval marketplace. Hired men and women with signs over their chests and flyers in their hands walked the street calling, we buy gold, we buy diamonds. Dealers convened in pairs, making verbal contracts, gossiping about who bought the three character for 50,000 or how much that special art deco, art deco necklace sold for. Armored trucks stood parked on the street while couriers sorted diamond deliveries under the scanning eyes of guards with guns and the civilians of 47th Street, the customers, pressed their noses against the ground floor window displays. Inside the windows, earrings hung like fruit from little cushion trees. Necklaces were draped around plastic busts. Gold chains dangled from hooks on suction cups. Diamonds were peppered onto brooches and bracelets like garnishes. Glittering hearts, skulls, starfish, whatever you desire. Deeper into the street, I reached the exchange at 10 West 47th Street. It felt like a casino. Men and women stood around waiting for their lucky break. Dealers called out numbers, the prices and dimensions of stones. The room was packed so densely, they hardly needed to move to show someone a diamond. I squeezed through the narrow aisles lined by jewel-filled booths. Two men played cards over a showcase, another sucked on an unlit cigar, and a few uniformed guards milled around aimlessly. Each company in the exchange had a display case and a booth the size of a half bathroom. Dealers sat on stools or folding chairs or leaned onto their cases. On the cubicle walls hung dollar bills, family pictures, and signs explaining refund policies. Some booths, even those of non-Hasidim, had a picture of the famed white-bearded Lubavitcher Rebbe, who many devotees, undeterred by his death in 1994, believed to be the Messiah.